Amen. Please be seated. Well, as promised, we are, we've now finally made our way into another book of the Bible. Uh, this morning our sermon passage is taken from 1 Kings chapter 1. But before we get there, we will uh, be reading from the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 33. Luke 1, 26 to 33. And then we'll turn to 1 Kings chapter 1. Uh, and we'll be... Uh, taking a look at verses 1 to 10 this morning. 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. So those are our scripture reading and our sermon passage for today. First, we'll go to Luke chapter 1, where I'll begin reading at verse 26. Brothers and sisters, just a brief reminder that these uh, words that you are about to hear read, these words that you are about to read along uh, uh, with me, these words are not the words of, of an ordinary person. Um, these are not uh, man-made, uh, human-written words. These are the words of the Lord. It is God himself who is speaking to you. And so it's, it's incumbent upon you, it's very important uh, that you give your full attention to God as he talks to you, as he speaks to you. It's important for us to speak to the Lord. We do so in prayer, but we also need to wait upon the Lord. We need to listen to him when he speaks to us. This is the word of the Lord, Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26, reading through verse 33. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel of the Lord said, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And now turning to 1 Kings chapter 1, beginning at verse 1 and reading through verse 10. Now King David was old and advanced in years. And although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. Therefore his servants said to him, let a, young man be, uh, let a young woman be sought for my lord the king, and let her wait on the king, and be in his service. Let her lie in your arms, that my lord the king may be warm. So they sought for a beautiful young woman throughout all the country, uh, territory of Israel, and found Abishag the Shuman, Shunammite, and brought her to the king. The young woman was very beautiful, and she was of service to the king, and attended him, but the king knew her not. Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and fifty men to run before him. His father had never at any time displeased him by asking, Why have you done thus and so? He was also a very handsome man, and he was born next after Absalom. He conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and they followed Adonijah and helped him. But Zadok the priest, and Benaniah the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan the prophet, and Shimei, and Ray, and David's mighty men were not with Adonijah. Adonijah sacrificed sheep, oxen, and fattened cattle by the serpent's stone, which is beside Enrogel. And he invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the royal officials of Judah, but he did not invite Nathan the prophet, or Benaniah, the, or the mighty men, or Solomon, his brother. This ends the reading of God's holy word. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we pray that by your spirit you would give us insight into your word and this new portion of it in which we find ourselves this morning. Well, Lord, we are grateful for the author of 1 Kings. We're thankful for his desire to continue on the work of recording the history of your covenant people and of the kings of Israel and Judah. And we're thankful, Lord, that he gives us the rest of the story, that he fills out this picture of King David in the, the last few days, uh, the last few weeks, perhaps, of his life. 
And so we pray, Lord, that you would bless us as we look into your word, as we delve into it, as uh, your word is now preached. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, I must admit, I have never been much of a watcher of the Royals. And I don't mean the Kansas City or the Richland High School varieties. I'm speaking of the British Royals. There's an entire cottage industry devoted uh, to those who watch the Royals, but I have never followed them very closely. It's not my thing. I must admit, when I was a young child, uh, I think my mom made us wake up early so we could watch the wedding of Prince Charles and Princess Diana. I don't think I was very happy about it. I think I did watch at least part of the wedding of William and Kate. Maybe I'm giving myself away, and I am more of a royal watcher than I want to admit. But like many, when Queen Elizabeth recently died, I did watch some of the coverage of her funeral and of her burial and was more aware than usual of what was going on surrounding those events. And much of the coverage that surrounded the Queen's death, it centered on the rivalry between Prince William and Prince Harry and Prince Harry's being marginalized by then Prince Charles, his father. Now, as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. The rivalries and the animosity present among Queen Elizabeth's progeny is certainly nothing new, and really nothing in comparison with other royals in the more distant past. But David's house, as it had been before in 1 Kings 1, is again plagued with palace intrigue when his son Adonijah, the brother of Absalom, sets himself up as king. The first four verses of the passage serve the purpose of clearly demonstrating that David is very old and infirmed, which provides the perfect opportunity for Adonijah to assert what he believes is his rightful place on David's throne. Now, Going back to the British royals for just a moment, I remember that within the past decade, Prince Charles was said to be lamenting the fact that he might never be king because his mother might outlive him, and she very well nearly did. Adonijah, the only surviving son of his mother Haggath, probably felt the same way. But now that David was finally in the waning moments of his life, Adonijah saw his chance to assert himself. He believed that he was the rightful heir to the throne of David. Now, by this time, David had been king for almost 40 years, and the date that these events took place was in the mid-960s B.C. But David will die. He's going to die very soon in relation to our passage this morning. And though Solomon will be king after him, and he himself reigned for 40 years, after his death, the kingdoms of Israel uh, and Judah, they will be split into two separate entities. Though Israel was a type of the permanent kingdom that still is to come, it wasn't permanent, and it was never intended to be permanent. But God's forever kingdom, ruled by his forever king, is right now being built. It's being established. And that leads us to the central theme of the sermon that I'd ask you to keep before you today as we work our way through the passage. Though every earthly government and institution will come to an end, Jesus Christ reigns over a kingdom which will have no end. Let me say that again. Though every earthly government and institution will come to an end, Jesus Christ reigns over a kingdom which will have no end. Well, the sermon today just has two parts. The first, a double-seasoned saint. And the second, self-exaltation of an heir. Again, the first point of the sermon, a double-seasoned saint. The second, self-exaltation of an heir. So let's look at this first part of the sermon, a double-seasoned saint. Though the specifics border on the weird for listeners in the 21st century with our 21st century ears, the first four verses are here because they introduce to the reader the fact that David, long the epitome of strength and vigor, is now an old man in his dotage. Verse 1 says, Now King David was old and advanced in years. Even in the last chapter of 2 Samuel, not knowing exactly when in David's life the events took place, he still had enough strength at that point. We must assume that he was fairly advanced in age, but he still had enough strength to build an altar to the Lord and make sacrifices upon it. But in verse 1, the author of 1 Kings uses two different words to stress his age, which, when considering he was only 70 years old, really serves to emphasize his diminished condition. David had lived a hard life. 
full of war, full of battle, full of being chased around. And he was greatly, greatly diminished in health and strength. And so it's a double diminished David that the author of 1 Kings presents us with in chapter 1, which is a perfect time for an enemy to strike. Now verse 1 continues to say that though his servants covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. Now I know that that's the way some of you feel here on Sunday mornings. <laughs> no matter how many coats you put on, you borrow your husband's coat, you put it on, you're still freezing because the temperature here is just too low. But for David, it was probably a situation where no matter how warm it might be weather-wise, he could find no relief from the constant feeling of freezing to death. And the solution his servants come up with is a creative one. They suggest to the king that they go in search of a young woman, literally a virgin, to serve him by lying down with him while he sleeps in his arms to keep him warm. Now there is reason to believe that this woman became one of David's wives, this young woman. Um, but I think it's an appropriate place to remind you that in some places in Scripture there are descriptions of behavior by the people being written about, and in other places there are prescriptions for behavior. This is one of those descriptive portions of Scripture. In other words, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 2 is not saying that this is something that everyone should do or that even, even that anyone should do, simply that this is what David's servants came up with to keep him warm. But it's clear that this arrangement is non-sexual in nature. The woman, uh, this young woman is a virgin, and verse 4 plainly states that David did not know her in the biblical sense. The young woman, we find out in verse 3, her name is Abishag, is the most beautiful woman in the land. Very beautiful, according to verse 4. And the town in which she lived, Shunem, was about 15 miles southwest of the Sea of Galilee, so fairly far north of uh, the city of Jerusalem where David lived. Although they didn't have intimate relations, Abishag's relationship to David was significant enough that after David's death, when Solomon had been inaugurated as king, Adonijah went to Bathsheba to ask her to ask Solomon to give him Abishag as his wife. But Solomon, seeing Adonijah's ploy for what it was, another attempt to become king, had Adonijah executed because of the request. As we saw with Absalom, for the son of a king to take uh, his father's wife or wives it was an act of asserting himself to be king in the minds of the people. If Adonijah gets Abishag as his wife, well, he must be the rightful king of Israel. And so apparently, for Abishag to share David's bed, she effectively became his wife, though they did not share intimate relations. And that brings us to the second point of the sermon, self-exaltation of an heir. Now, Adonijah, whose name means my Lord is Yahweh, seems to believe that he himself is Lord because he's taking matters into his own hands because of his father's declining health. Verse 5 says, Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. In fact, verses 5 and 6, when taken together, present Adonijah as the spitting image of his deceased older brother Absalom. The description of Adonijah's good looks, it's a direct reference to the description of Absalom in chapter, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 14, 25, which says, Now in all Israel there was no one so much to be praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. Now that Absalom is dead, he's out of the way, Adonijah ascends to that position of being the most handsome man. And when he exalts himself with words saying, I will be king, it can be translated even more emphatically because of the pronouns that are used there in the Hebrew as, I and no other shall be king. Adonijah exalts himself because he has an exalted view of himself. Adonijah sees no possibility of any other son of David being king. Solomon doesn't even enter his mind. And part of the reason for his exalted view of himself is given in verse 6. His father had never at any time displeased him by asking, Why have you done thus and so? He was also a very handsome man. And he was born uh, after, uh, next after Absalom. Well, commentator J.P. Falkelman writes this. He says, David has become too weak to learn from his remissness concerning Absalom whose activities he had failed to bring to a halt as both father and king. Likewise, in the case of Adonijah, he neglects the duty of a father from the very start, never setting limitations. 
David would rather avoid the unavoidable conflicts involved in bringing up children and arising in every normal parent-child relationship. In so doing, he has brought misery upon himself and, in this case, especially upon his family. A child who has never been confronted with boundaries can hardly develop a sense of what is and is not permissible or estimate his own capacities. Great parenting advice from an Old Testament commentator. But what Falkelman is saying is that the greatest of the kings of Israel was a failure in many ways. And may we fathers today learn from the mistakes and failures of our father in the faith, David. David's permissiveness with Adonijah had led to the events of this day, but as Adonijah will later admit, the Lord had other plans. Adonijah was emboldened and enabled by many high-placed individuals. Verse 7 says that he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abiathar, the, the, the priest, and they followed him and helped him. And verse 9 lists the various influential people who came to his banquet. Now, Adonijah had, like his brother, won the genetics lottery. And like so many beautiful people, he had an entourage of devotees who fawned over him and encouraged him in his power grab. This should be a lesson to all of us because we are all prone to place our hope in politicians as if, as if they're our savior rather than in King Jesus. We're all prone to place our hope in the beautiful people, the stars of Hollywood or those who uh, mingle with them. But if Adonijah had truly been heir to the throne of David, he would have had no need to exalt himself. He wouldn't have needed to try to seize the throne. When the angel visited Mary in Luke chapter 1 to tell her that she was going to give birth to a son who she is to, make, to give the name Jesus, he tells her in verses 32 and 33, He will be great and will be called the Son of, of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Jesus did not grasp for power. Jesus did not try to seize the throne of David. In fact, he had given up power. He left his position in heaven. The passage from Luke says that the Lord God will give him the throne. Now, if David was a type of Christ, and he was, then, then Adonijah is a type of Antichrist. David was given the throne by God, but Adonijah tried to take it. And Joab and Abiathar, the, among others, tried to help uh, Adonijah take it. But verse 8 gives uh, an important list of names who were not of people who were not with Adonijah. Zadok the priest, Beniah the son of Jehoiada, who was an officer in David's army and one of those of great renown among the 30 of David's mighty men. And also Nathan the prophet was not with Adonijah, nor was Shimei, probably not the Shimei who cursed David as he fled Absalom, but the one in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 18, who was one of Solomon's 12 officers over all Israel. And Ray, who was unknown to us, was not with Adonijah, as uh, were uh, David's mighty men. They also did not follow Adonijah. Adonijah's supporters, Joab and Abiathar, as well as the ones mentioned in verse 9, who came to his banquet, all of his brothers, except notably Solomon, and all of the royal officials of Judah, made up an impressive list of dignitaries. And they certainly helped to submit, uh, cement Adonijah's exalted view of himself. And at this banquet, Adonijah sacrificed sheep and oxen and fattened cattle by the serpent's stone, which was near En Rogel. And Kylan Dalich write, Adonijah uh, commenced his usurpation like Absalom with a solemn sacrificial meal at which he was proclaimed king. Now, in addition to Solomon, those who were absent included Nathan, Benaiah, and all of the mighty men. None of these men were invited to the banquet which is clear evidence that Adonijah at least knew at some point he had an inkling that Solomon was supposed to be David's successor. Adonijah did not want anybody at his party who would ruin it. But he did want the people of Israel to believe based upon the banquet and those who attended it that he was the rightful heir to the throne. As we'll see in coming weeks, the throne of David, it will survive this attempted coup d'etat by Adonijah. And even though Israel and Judah would split after Solomon died, David's throne would continue on until 586 B.C. when Jerusalem was destroyed. 
But as we see, David was not the forever king. God promised that the, the forever king would come after him. Solomon was not the forever king. He was a good king. But like his father, he had many, many flaws. And God's forever king isn't the person who lives in the White House, not now nor at any time. God's forever king is Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come. Even now, Christ Jesus is king. And he will reign forever in a kingdom that will have no end. Christ's kingdom cannot be shaken because it has been established by Almighty God. Though Satan would love to destroy it, the kingdom of God is eternal, and Satan's threats against it are empty words. The kingdom of Jesus Christ will last forever and ever. And everyone who believes in Jesus will live in his kingdom forever and ever. And that, brothers and sisters, is good news. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious God and King, we are thankful that you have brought us into your kingdom. You have welcomed us into your kingdom. You've made us citizens of it. You've called us out of the kingdom of darkness, of sin, of death. You've called us into the glorious kingdom of light. Lord, far too often we have one foot in both kingdoms. Far too often we forget that our true, our lasting, our ultimate citizenship is with you in heaven. Far too often we think that our temporary digs are permanent. We pray that you would help us to remember that we are citizens of your kingdom, that we are children of the king. We pray, O oh Lord, that you'd help us to walk accordingly. We pray that you would remind us, O oh Lord, that our hope is not in the strength of any person. Our hope is in the Lord. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> our hymn of response is number 166. Wondrous King, all glorious, please stay.